Tonight on News Now, a new segment looking at the viral stories burning up the internet and a look at what's happening in Metro Detroit this weekend. Joining us now is podcaster Taylor Vitani. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me, Kevin. Yeah, it's nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. So one of the things burning up the internet this week, and it just won't seem to go away, is the coronavirus. Definitely. Uh, cruise ships are... Yes, yeah, so um, there was a cruise ship that was going through Japan. Um, there was over 40 Americans that tested positive for the coronavirus on that cruise ship. Um, so they're saying that they will not allow them to come back into the U.S. without getting a permit that they are cleared of the coronavirus and they're going to do lots of tests and even when they are approved to come back uh, they'll have to do further testing for another 14 days it says. I was on a cruise ship one time for a story we were doing bargain cruise ships to see if they were worth the money mm -hmm. and this was a pretty small cruise ship but it was hitting every wave and people yeah. were puking all over the place. People say you either love it or you hate it and I'm sure these people are probably a little bit burned on the cruise ship thing. <laughs> no. no matter how big a cruise ship looks it gets small really quick. Yes. There's oh. only so many places to eat and so many Absolutely. restaurants and bars to go to. Right. And Absolutely. to be stuck at sea does not sound very fun. I can't imagine. I always was seasick as a kid. Um, I get car sick very easy. So I can't imagine being on there for days on end with no escape. That seems kind of scary to me, but I know a lot of people love doing the cruises. Um, like I said, I feel like this is probably a huge bummer for those people that probably <laughs> thought they were going to go and have a great time and then here they're stuck, you know, in Japan with the coronavirus. Um, but like I said, doctors are taking precautions and everything and, and things, there hasn't been any casualties or anything like as far as I know. So and if you think things are bad on a cruise ship, uh, how, how about in China where people are being held up at gunpoint? Yes. Yeah. So um, there were men who stole toilet paper. I guess toilet paper is a hot commodity right now. Um, <laughs> and people are just basically searching for whatever they can find. A lot of things, you know, are a lot harder to buy now. Um, I heard the masks of, are they running out of masks. Uh, yes, yeah, and a lot of people, a lot of doctors are saying the masks only go so far, and I'm sure that's true. Um, but but everyone needs toilet paper. Yeah, every, <laughs> that's right. Everybody does need toilet paper, and so they have found uh, two of the three suspects um, from the robbery. Uh, but they're still kind of doing an investigation for the third. So. It sounds kind of funny, but it gives you a sense of, of the panic that exists oh, yeah. in China with everybody being quarantined and mm -hmm. everybody so worried. The Absolutely. fact that people would um, go to such lengths, it's, it's scary. Right, like they're not stealing anything like TVs or, you know, they're stealing toilet paper. And that kind of shows you how much dire need is there for something as significant as that you know so it's a big deal i know you're not dr vitani but uh, i'm not but, but you did look up <laughs> I, I feel like on I tv am, right? <laughs> <laughs> you play one on tv uh, I, I understand you did uh, look at some of the things people need to be doing to protect yes, themselves yes absolutely um so i did a lot of research on this um obviously it's, it's your common things that doctors tell you to do to stay clean to stay bacteria free um it's very important to in order to prevent yourself from you know, any kind of virus, including the coronavirus, is, you know, wash your hands regularly, not just after restroom, like throughout the day, wash your hands, make sure you're getting under the fingernails. And this includes soap. I mean, I can't believe I have to say this, but <laughs> soap and water and at least for 20 seconds underneath the fingernails. Um, do that regularly throughout the day and that really helps a lot. And then obviously try to make sure that you're staying a distance from anyone that may be a possible threat to that virus um, or any virus. Um, and then, you know, just make sure that you're washing around you, your surroundings. Um, if you feel like someone's coughing or sneezing a lot, you know, yeah, it might just be cold or the flu, but it could be something more. And that's where people need to kind of be a little more cautious. Or just so. hide out in your basement for a few right, months. Right, right. Just do the apocalypse thing, make, get a bunch of canned food, go in your basement and don't come out for a few months. You'll be All fine. right, the other thing going viral that I see is this great debate, the the airline recliner seat. Are, are yes. you someone who reclines uh, your seat in the in I the am, and you, and you wouldn't think so. I'm so, I'm so sure. I really, I don't even know why I do it. It doesn't, it's not like it goes back far, you know? It's not like it makes too much of a difference. But I mean, I've always done it and I feel like people have always been the person in front of me doing it. Um, for me, it's like not really that big of a deal only because it doesn't go back too far. If it went back any further, I feel like I would probably be like, oh, 
Right. If you haven't seen the video, there's this woman uh, who reclines, and the man behind her is just beating on her seat, just hitting really? it repeatedly, oh. trying to get her to uh, uh, put her seat back up in the upright position. Right. Of course, the, the planes come with a reclining seat, so you would think you'd right. be allowed to, to recline. On my last flight, I recline. I, I always recline. Mm -hmm. um, but the person in front of me reclined, and I immediately go, oh, yeah, I want to recline. I recline. And uh, the person like behind me got effect. mad. <laughs> and they called the, uh, the attendant to come really? and tell me to put my seat up. And I said, why? I said, well, could you just do it while we're eating? I said, well, all right, well, you get them to put theirs up and them to put theirs up and them right. to put theirs up. I ended up putting mine up. But, right. but I, I feel like I'm, I'm a recliner. Oh, me too. I just feel like if, if there's any extra way to get more comfortable on a plane, I do it. You know, I know that that's a cramped space, and I've been on some long flights where you'll do anything for any extra comfort. So I know that feeling of wanting to recline, and I feel like it's not too much of a difference from unreclined. So to me, it's it's worth the recline, I suppose. Tell us what's going on this weekend. Well, there is a big festival. Um, it's the Beer and Wine Festival coming up in Detroit. Um, it's at Shed Three. Um, there's going to be live entertainment. Um, there's going to be I mean, over 150 different, you know, beers from different breweries and wines from different wineries. Um, it's going to be a great time. I've to seen have it pictures of this, and yeah. I, it really looks fun. And it, it's an opportunity to try all kinds of different uh, Michigan beers and wines and, and whatnot. Yeah. Uh, and they, they must heat the sheds, I take it, because it's going to be cold this weekend. Oh, I'm sure they do. I've never been there myself, but I do always see, you know, pictures online of it. And I'm always like, every year, I'm like, I'm going to go to that. So I think I will go this year. It's on February 21st. Um, tickets are available online. All you got to do is Google it. Um, and the admission is, I think, 45 for general admission and then 65 for VIP. Um, VIP starts at 7 um, and then general starts at 8 and it goes till 11 p.m. that night. All right. Did you see this other story out of Eastern Market, this uh, new vodka that they have for Fat Tuesday? I heard, I heard a little bit about it, but I know you were telling me about it a little bit ahead of time. They're, uh, this, these local distillers uh, created a Punchki vodka, and Punchki is this uh, jelly donut that uh, Catholics have before right. on Fat Tuesday, the day before Lent starts. Yep. And uh, people line up in Hamtramck to uh, to get these donuts on, on, on Fat Tuesday. Oh, trust me, my boyfriend and his family are Polish, and okay. so they love They know the Punchki. Yeah, they, they love them. Yes. Well, this is a big vat of vodka, and they drop uh, several dozen I think it's raspberry punch keys oh, into yeah. the vodka and they let it sit for several days <laughs> nice. and so they they tried it before they you know made it in volume mm -hmm. and I guess they sold out of it uh, very quickly like really? everybody who tried well, that it makes sense. seemed to <laughs> like it so they quickly put together uh, a bunch of uh, a, a bunch of vodka uh, Punchki vodka for Fat Tuesday and uh, it's going to be uh, on sale uh, in uh, in the uh, that Eastern sounds market. like it'll go well. I, I think that will. It will sell a lot. <laughs> Another thing you'll have to try. Right. I'll, I'd like to try it all. The so. wine and beer festival and the vodka. Right. And then <laughs> Not all at once, home. right? <laughs> <laughs> catch you Thanks for being here. Thank you so fun. much. All right. We'll be right back with more news now after this. Michael Bloomberg had been running his campaign almost entirely by TV commercials until last night when he finally had to debate with other candidates. By most accounts, he did not do very well and needs to do much better next time around. Joining us now to talk about it is political expert Josh Bitterman. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me, Kevin. Nice so to that, see you. That was fun last night, I thought. I it mean, was. Right? They took uh, just a, a little bit of time to just start swinging. Yeah. And uh, it looked like Michael Bloomberg was the punching bag. It definitely was. Uh, energetic debate, fun to watch for sure. Uh, I thought Elizabeth Warren had a surprisingly strong night. I thought Pete Buttigieg had some strong moments, but without question, the big loser uh, was Michael Bloomberg. Let's talk about Buttigieg, uh, because he needs to keep his momentum going. He got off to a good start in Iowa, did fine in New Hampshire. Mm -hmm. He's leading in the delegates. Uh, but but now, as you look at the national polls, he drops like all the way to fourth and some places fifth. Uh, what does he have to do to actually stay in this thing? I think the fact that his name ID, the awareness of what he has done, uh, that's going to continue to hamper him being the mayor of a relatively small community in the Midwest. Although I think he effectively kind of puts that argument back on the fact that I do represent the Rust Belt. I represent a lot of the forgotten men and women, so to speak, and juxtaposing that against Washington, D.C. experience, I think continues to be effective for him. I think the challenge, though, for Democrats, particularly in the moderate wing, is the fact that with the poor performance of Mayor Bloomberg last night, there is no clear person to really coalesce behind 
behind. Uh, Joe Biden is staggered right now, but could have a strong performance and a comeback in South Carolina. But the longer that this continues to stretch on and you have Amy Klobuchar, Pete Buttigieg, Joe Biden, Mayor Bloomberg occupying space and sucking air out of that moderate uh, wing. That's going to be a real challenge for Democrats against the progressive wing with Bernie Sanders. So Bloomberg's memo was right. Uh, these people need to drop out and let him, uh, <laughs> him take over. I think in self-serving fashion, <laughs> without question. But uh, what was fascinating last night to me, and I think to most, was the lack of preparedness for questions that he and his team absolutely knew were coming. Isn't that wild? Most notably with regard to the allegations over creating a hostile work environment for women. And I think when your response to those allegations is not to refute them, but essentially just to say that, well, I employ a lot of women in my company, the ones in my I've foundation. Kept the ones I've kept secret are not that big a deal. Yeah, worry and, about it. and then the arrogance to say that, well, maybe just the women didn't like the jokes that I were telling. I don't think as a Democrat nominee for president, particularly in the era of Me Too, that's a strong place to operate I was from. watching that and I was thinking about uh, his uh, debate prep and I'm thinking, does he just have a bunch of yes people who no matter what, they just say, yes, you're the great it's like I almost in my mind I'm picturing this debate prep where they're saying, "Well, you were a fantastic mayor. Uh, how how are you going to be a president?" You sure. Know? Instead of hitting them with what they knew was coming, because he did. He looked like a deer in headlights. Without question, I, and I actually heard some pundits talking about that this morning, saying that essentially whoever prepped Elizabeth Warren, that's exactly who's mayor uh, Bloomberg's going to hire. hire. Yeah, exactly. right, right. Yeah, she really landed him. Uh, her timing was right. Big uh, time. I even fell for that uh, when she was describing what I thought was President Trump and she landed on Bloomberg. I, I fell for it. Uh, sure. So, I, yeah, I want to get your take, though, on uh, uh, on Amy Klobuchar because uh, she was riding high out of New Hampshire and it was all, you know, boy, you know, t take a look at her. Mm -hmm. um, but she doesn't have a lot of money and she needs to keep scoring quickly if she's going to hang around past Super Tuesday. Sure. Uh, I think she's done a nice job to date. I don't think she did herself a lot of favors last night. I thought the segment from Telemundo asking her about, you know, her forgetting the name of the president of Mexico was sort of unfair. And Senator Warren kind of came to her rescue in that regard. But I think she came across a little bit too much trying to look like the victim. Didn't look like a powerful candidacy in those moments. Uh, and that's why I felt like Mayor Buttigieg had a much stronger night for that particular wing of the party. Uh, Joe Biden has been quiet, uh, really quiet, uh, but uh, South Carolina is supposed to be better for him. And when you look at the national polls, he's in second place, not that far behind Sanders. Sure. Uh, so as you go forward, does he does he rebound back uh, in whether or not he did well last night? Some people say he was OK. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, what does he have to do to catch up to Sanders? He's hanging on by a thread. I think the major difference between those two candidacies is that the energy and the connection with voters with Bernie Sanders is real and it's palpable. I don't think that Joe Biden has the ability to inspire. And that's not just this candidacy. It's every time he's run for president, he falls short. He's uh, prone for gaffes. Uh, he definitely has trouble stringing sentences together. And you almost feel bad for the guy. You know, watching last night and watching previous debates, it's just it doesn't seem like the energy is there. It doesn't seem like he's up for this. And I really struggle to, to figure out if he's going to make it. I think for a while, a lot of people thought that the party is just going to drag him across the finish line. But the writing sounds like it's starting to be on the wall, particularly with major donors drying up. And I think unless he has a major comeback performance in South Carolina, he is inevitably done. Well, people really liked him as vice president. And he had a lot of personality. And I think people are really surprised that he's not doing so well. I mean, he doesn't look uh, engaged at, at, as much as you would expect. Um, but going forward, uh, you know, on the stage last night, he said, hey, uh, look at your own polls, NBC. I'm the one who can beat Trump. Sure. Uh, is he the one who can beat Trump? Or is Bernie Sanders the one who can beat Trump? Or is it just become whoever's the most popular? they have to get everyone who hates Trump to sure. vote. Sure. Well, I think a lot of us know, especially early on in this process, that name ID really carries favor with a lot of those poll results. And so I think you still have some of that right now. Uh, I think the Democrat Party is absolutely terrified of Bernie Sanders running. Uh, I think that his best chances for defeating President Trump actually were in 2016. You still had a shaky economy. You still had an anemic recovery. And I think his message, uh, much the way that President Trump's message carried favor with a lot of Rust Belt voters, the quote unquote forgotten 
men and women, um, Bernie was able to connect with them. And I, th I still think he does. However, you fast forward three and a half years later, you have a booming economy, largely spurred on by tax cuts, deregulation, certainly a capitalist system. And I don't necessarily know how effective a message of socialism or socialist policies is going to work well, nor do I think that a socialist candidate can win without the support of moderate Democrats and independents. And I think the other reason that Democrats are absolutely terrified is that all of a sudden you have a socialist running for president, and now you've really put uh, down ballot races on the congressional side and the Senate side in play. If uh, Elizabeth Warren were to drop out, if she runs out of money, uh, would her would her people all go to Bernie Sanders though, and would he just be so far ahead of, of Joe Biden? And what if uh, what if Buttigieg and Klobuchar fell out? Would they go to Biden and keep Biden alive? Um, I think if you were to have asked that question maybe three or four weeks ago, um, that's a more plausible scenario. Now, I think because of the poor performances of Bloomberg and the confusion surrounding Biden and who really controls that wing, um, I just don't see the coalescence. And I think that you're going to see this play out for a long time. And the longer that this plays out, that fissure between the progressive wing and the moderate wing is going to continue to grow and to hurt them. Well, the fact that Bloomberg uh, is polling third nationally tells me he's going to stick around. Sure. He's already hired his people through November. Do you think it's going to end up being Bernie and Bloomberg then? Um, tough to say at this point. I think Bloomberg certainly can recover. He's going to have to do a lot better than he did last night. Uh, I think whether Joe Biden or not, I mean, again, hinges on whether or he performs well in, in, in South Carolina. And we'll just have to see how it shakes out. Yeah, I'm not sure anyone's paying attention yet, honestly. I think uh, the Super Tuesday, people will look and then yeah. it, it go from there. I think, uh, yeah, not a great first impression by Bloomberg, but I'm not sure it matters that much yet. Sure. It's pretty early. I would tend to agree. All right, thanks for being here. We'll be right back with more news now after this. Some are calling it the best debate of all time. Michael Bloomberg, a punching bag for most of the night as multiple candidates attacked the former New York mayor on multiple topics. President Trump called Michael Bloomberg's performance the worst in the history of debates. Joining us on the line now is political strategy analyst and our expert, Roshini Rashkumar. Welcome to the show, Roshini. Thanks, Kevin. Yes, I definitely would call it the best debate so far from the Democrats. It was fun to watch, that's for sure. Um, you know, it took about, what, uh, 18 seconds for the first haymaker to be thrown. Uh, Elizabeth Warren going right at Michael Bloomberg. What, what, what were your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, it was definitely like WWE Raw. You know, I mean, it really was a smackdown in a lot of ways. Every one of those candidates had something negative to say about Mike Bloomberg off the top. He probably expected that. You know, he's no idiot. But what I was stunned at is someone like him, who is a savvy business person, obviously very rich, as he pointed out multiple times, he did not seem very well prepared or well coached or whatever for a night like last night because all eyes were definitely on him. He seemed like he was caught off guard. He looked like a deer in headlights. I, and I, we know because we talked to his people that they did uh, uh, debate prep. And there's just no way that they didn't know those were the questions that were going to be coming at him. Yet when they came at him, it looked like it was the first time he had ever heard them. Yeah, I mean, in his response, I think my most favorite of the bad responses was how he handled the exchange with Elizabeth Warren, Senator Warren, on the non-disclosure agreement. I mean, that was textbook bad. You know, it's like we can study why that was a bad way to deal with it, because basically it leaves all of us believing everything she said, that he did say all those things. And, um, you know, it's, it's pretty ridiculous, like both that one as well as how she introduced uh, by kind of comparing and making some lines that you might think she's talking about President Trump. And she said, no, I'm talking about Mike Bloomberg. So neither the response to neither of those questions were winning responses. He was almost like just violent, really, uh, or he had something fairly idiotic to say. So it's it's too bad because I was sort of looking for him to bring it and to maybe challenge some of these other people who have become the front runners. And he really definitely lost that debate. Elizabeth Warren definitely landed her punches. Did, do you see her as the winner of, of the Democrats last night? You know, she needed to have a really good showing, and she did. I think it's a toss-up between Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren, if we're going to call it a winner, because he, Senator 
Sanders didn't have to say too much, and he came out ahead. And then whenever he did speak, he always had either a zinger or he was just poised. He was looking at the camera, all these kinds of things that were really natural. He wasn't reading off notes, whereas she really had some substantive comments to make. She came out like this debater that she prides herself in being. So it was a toss-up for me between the two of them as to who won. Now, Senator Warren needed to have a really big night. And she did. So on that sense, she won because she if she needs to keep this campaign going, she needed a night like that. Yeah, I thought Bernie Sanders was very confident and very consistent. I didn't think he hit any grand slams or anything, but he did what he needed to do. I'm curious what you think about Joe Biden. How did he do? Well, I just think Vice President Biden needs to get out of the race. I mean, I am watching body language. I'm watching facial expressions and the times that he is responding to various questions. If you just kind of look at how he's kind of searching for how to say it right, his his lips are kind of quivering. I mean, it it he just didn't seem presidential in many of those moments. So I'm concerned for him. I'm concerned for his campaign. And I think he would do a lot of people uh, a good service by dropping out. Yeah, you know, I was watching him and he was having a hard time getting anybody's attention. Nobody really seemed that interested in what he had to say in the beginning. Uh, But some people that watched it thought that uh, as the debate went on, he did better and he seemed like the grown up in the room. Uh, But I don't think he did what he needed to do to make a move uh, at at this point. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And he he also really needed a strong showing. And I think it's just, you know, with the polls and, and, you know, he's been kind of all over the board with the polls. But you've got to imagine, you know, a lot of people who answer these polls are probably, you know, people are really tuned in or maybe they're kind of the quote unquote regular voter. I think when you really discern what's happening on these stages, that's where we're going to see who is going to come out ahead. And, you know, we have Nevada, we have Super Tuesday coming up. It will be interesting to see actual votes beyond the polls. I've never been a huge believer in polls, so I'm very, very eager to see what happens on Super Tuesday. I think Michael Bloomberg's favorite part of the debate may have been when Amy Klobuchar and uh, Pete Buttigieg started fighting because it moved the cameras down uh, towards them and uh, gave him a chance to just sort of uh, rest up quietly. What did you think of those two going at each other? What do you think of their chances going forward? Did they do enough to move the needle? You know, both of them had a few strong answers and they also had some blunders. So the Mondale reference by by Mayor Pete wasn't really a good one. It, it, it wasn't funny. It didn't make sense. It was really disrespectful. And he didn't need to say it. I mean, he could have gotten his point across in other ways. But she was very defensive. So she had some strong moments earlier on. But then if you really watched her facial expressions, if you go back and look at some tape, Kevin, she was getting very defensive and um, a little passive aggressive. So I think that is going to ultimately come out and hurt her, but we shall see what happens on Saturday in Nevada, if it really did. I think the real winner last night might have been President Trump. What do you think his reaction was watching this? We saw on Twitter that he he, uh, poked fun at Bloomberg, saying that he was terrible in the debate, But, but what do you think his take overall was as he watched sort of all of these Democrats sort of beat up each other with none of them really moving forward? You know, it's funny that you mentioned that because I watched it, you know, cover to cover, gavel to gavel. And at one point I turned to my husband, who is kind of in and out of watching it, and I said, if President Trump is watching this right now, he's smiling because this is his competition. So, you know, he was a big winner with last night. But I I was happy to see as just, you know, a nonpartisan, someone who is pretty objective in how we evaluate everybody, uh, I was happy to see some fire. You know, it was an exciting debate. There was so much going on in the Twitter sphere that uh, you knew different kinds of people, lots of different people, different age brackets, different political persuasions were watching that debate last night based on the very high activity on Twitter. And that's what we need to do as Americans and as voters is we need to watch, we need to discern, we need to hear what they're saying and then be the judge on election day or primary day, as the case may be. And that is the silver lining, that more people are getting engaged. And sometimes you need to uh, set a little fire under everyone to make that happen. 
And I was glad to see that the moderators didn't get in the way. Uh, they they did a decent job. They just asked the questions and uh, and kind of let the uh, well, the moderators had it easy because these candidates were actually just kind of raising their hands, going back and forth, replying. Um, you know, I didn't think it was actually a very well moderated debate, Kevin. Frankly, they lost control of you know the stage, but whatever. They did allow the drama to happen on stage, and that was really fun to watch. All right, Rashidi, thanks for joining us. We appreciate your time. Thank you. That's our show for tonight. Thanks for watching. For everyone at News Now, I'm Kevin Dietz. Good night.